okay? I wasn't going to call and ask him to preach. I just, the Lord, I knew a lot of folks didn't know what was going on and, and what all had happened with us. And I, I been, me and my wife and I have been praying the Lord had laid on his heart, just whether preaching or just give me a few minutes just to kind of explain where we're at. So when he called the Lord, just as he has many times with Pastor J.D. and I just worked in both of our hearts, and I'm thankful. You can be opening your Bibles to Job chapter number 23. I want to uh, just take a few minutes and just kind of fill you in, and then I'm just going to give you my heart. This is not a message I would probably preach out, but I'm not a guest preacher no more. I'm just a member of the church. I'm an unemployed preacher. And uh, so I'm just going to give you my heart tonight, and during all that God was doing in our life, just where I was, where my family was, and to a degree when we came here where we still were. And... It probably won't be the, the, the best message I've preached, but I hope that maybe it'll at least show you what God has done, what he's doing, and, and maybe hopefully help someone tonight in the process. I do want to thank the church. Y'all have been very kind and uh, very supportive. I told my wife several years ago, I don't remember how long we've been coming up here. It's way longer than three years. I don't know how long, but I told my wife several years ago, I said, you know, if anything ever happened to me, I said, I, I hope that you and the kids will move to First Baptist and just join there. Uh, God had so knit our church and, and our hearts with y'all and with the staff and with Pastor Ouellette, Pastor J.D., Brother Cowling, just, just everybody, that I said, if I can't be their pastor, I would just assume them sit here. had no idea God was not going to just let them sit here, but let me sit here. Now, it's crossed my mind a couple times, Lord, am I dying, and that's why you've put me up here to go and get Leanne and the kids ready. It's actually crossed my wife's mind because she said, you don't think God's going to get us up there and then take you and, and leave me here, are you? I said, well, I hope not, but you're in a good place and you're already moved if that happens, amen. <laughs> um, I don't know where to begin. I'm just going to share my heart. Let me pray, and then I'm just going to jump into the message, jump into to where I believe God wants us tonight. Father, I need you now. Lord, I, I've never, I don't think I've ever gotten a pulpit to impress. I don't believe, though I know I'm flesh and I'm human. God, I honestly want to make a difference tonight, and this pulpit is not about me, it's about you. And so I want to use my story, but not God from a sense of I'm somebody or, or I'm anything or my family's anything, but that you're somebody and that you're everything. And God, I pray you help me tonight. I pray the Spirit of God anoint this service. I don't want to just fill a space and a slot. Some of the greatest preachers are sitting right under the sound of my voice. God, I believe you put us under the best pastor we could possibly have in Brother J.D. He's not just my friend. He's my pastor and his wife and his children, and I thank you for them. I thank you for the men of God that sit in this place on a weekly basis. And I'm thankful that I get to be a part of a church that's doing something. And God, I pray you help us now. I need you. Use me and use this time, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Job chapter 23, let me start reading in verse number 1. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my calls before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Father, again, I need you. I know I just prayed, but I just sense, Lord, needing your power and your help to, to say everything you want said. But God, guard my lips on anything that I don't need to say tonight. Use the message to challenge someone, and God encourage me and my family through the message. And bless this church in Jesus' name. 
Job we're all familiar with tonight, and I don't know that there's a human being on top side of God's earth that has faced what Job faced. We get into suffering or trials or trouble, and we're all able to look at the life of Job and really be encouraged at who he was, what he did, what he went through, and how he came out of it. You know, there's going to be times in your Christian life when in the darkest, the most depressing, the most difficult, the times that you're in doubt of everything, you need God, and you're not always going to be able to find Him. You're not going to be able to see Him. When He's silent, you're not even sometimes going to be able to sense Him. He's going to allow things in your life that is not going to make any sense. You're not going to be able to explain it. You're not going to be able to reason it. And you're not going to be able to justify why. As I look in the Word of God, I see characters in the Bible that, that felt that way. The, the prodigal son got to the hog pen and no doubt he said, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here and I've got a father back at the house. And, and I'm sure he felt as if God and his father had abandoned him completely because of the consequences of his sin. Samson, when he lost his power with God, probably wondered if God even cared or if God was there. Elijah, after his victory on Mount Carmel, was, was pursued by Jezebel and, and sat down and said, God, just, just let me die. He couldn't find God. Daniel who was used to hearing from God and getting answers quickly prayed and, and inquired and had to wait 21 days in the book of Daniel chapter 10 to get an answer, wondering, God, okay, what have I done? What's going on? The 400 years of what we call the, the, the silent period after the prophecies of Malachi till John the Baptist stepped on the, the, the ground and said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. 400 years of Christians serving God and people being faithful and, and many people going, doing what they knew to do. Yet in days of darkness and wickedness, 400 years, not one fresh word from God. Joseph and Mary, after God says you're going to have, after he tells her you're going to have a, a child though you're a virgin and tells Joseph that what is happening is of God, God doesn't speak again until the angels show up to worship with the shepherds. Paul in his many distresses in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us of not knowing what was going on and in perils and in great suffering and in great tragedy and then obviously the greatest character that we can talk about tonight Jesus when he's hanging on the cross said Eli, Eli, let us back the night which is to say my God, my God why hast thou forsaken me? By the way he was 100% God, but he was still 100% man. You may tonight feel assaulted. You may feel alone in your storm and in your problem. And you may have problems tonight where it seems there's no solution questions. It seems that there's no answers, conflicts. That seems that there's no provision, needs with no provision, conflict with no resolution, hurts with no healing or help. Doubts create confusion and your doubts create suspicion and vacillation and indecision and miscommunication and misunderstanding and mistreatment and misbehavior and misinformation or misinterpretation have left you feeling alone and in the dark. You may be experiencing a forfeiture of job, a failing family, fleeting health, frustrating conflicts, and feeling in the midst of all that that God is nowhere. To be found. Preacher, why would you say that? Well, Job, a man who God said was a man of integrity and character, one that eschewed April and was evil and was upright, a man that God held in high esteem, a man that walked with God. That's where he got. 
I've had trials over the years. We, Jonathan at two weeks old was diagnosed with the malaria and they said he wasn't going to live. And, and then they said I wasn't going to live to make it to 30 year old because of malaria and the other problems that I had. And, and we faced Lydia, our, one of our daughters that drowned in our pool and we didn't know she was down in there and, and it took God to raise her up. And, and, and I've, I've had trials and I've had troubles and I've had tribulations and, and situations. But just to be honest with you, when I would read through the book of Job and I've read it many times and I preached through the book and when I come to this chapter and, and I got to where Job said that I cannot see him and I cannot perceive him in verse 8 and, and I don't know where he's at. I'll be honest with you. I, I, in my mind, I said, I don't know that I've ever experienced that. But I have this year. I never quit praying. I never quit reading my Bible. As far as I know, I was right with God. But when God started dealing with my heart and said, you're done here at Emmanuel, I planned on being there the rest of my life. I had moved my elderly parents there a little over six years ago and, and helped them with the house and the church took good care of us and, and it's not like we had a lot extra. We didn't. We went from month to month, but we got a big family and I helped take care of my parents and I gave a lot back to the church and God was good to us and, and, and the Lord was blessing and, and I just tell you tonight that, that when we went into March, we were doing better than we'd ever done in spirit and in people being saved and soul winning and finally connected with our our church and we were winning people to Christ and and our church was growing and uh, many of you know about the trouble we had about four years ago with the split in our church and and an assistant taking a bunch of people and and it gutted us for a while and we had completely recovered numbers wise and and we keep completely recovered spirit and as a matter of fact we were doing better and and the church was doing great and there was not one drama not one fight not one problem not not one issue when I went into March everything was good and clicking and and just amazing how God was blessing. And the Lord said, At the end of March, you're done. I don't expect you to understand as a pastor of many years, I think you would understand to agree that the Bible likens a pastor to a shepherd and, and I know there's hirelings and I know there's men that don't care but I loved our church, I loved our people I gave every ounce of me to our church and to our ministry 24-7, probably too much and, and the Lord revealed that to me that, that if I ever pastor again I need to dedicate a little bit more time to my family than I did, not that I purposely tried to ignore them but just ministry got so busy and I got so tied up and things started growing and, and uh, multiplying faster than really I could keep up and the Lord started opening doors for me and, and I'm telling you I was not discouraged I was not down uh, I had, I've had a few preachers uh, that has asked did he disqualify himself absolutely not I'm as qualified right now as I was the day that God called me to preach I may not be a good preacher but I'm as qualified as I've been according to the word of God my whole ministry and I'm, I'm just saying tonight that, that, that everything was clicking and, and going good and the there was no fights with the deacons and uh, there was no fight with authority. There was no fight in the church. I mean, we were rolling. We were doing good. The only area that uh, we had suffered still was finances. And even that this year, that had come up and we were doing better than we'd ever done in every area. And God said, time to leave. It was like you took my heart and pulled it out and stomped it. I'm not asking for sympathy. God's been good. I'm just trying to explain. I know uh, when we got up here and I know we've been here a little over a month and, and church, I apologize if, if I've seemed a little off or my family seemed a little off. This was the biggest decision we've ever made in our life. There's no other place on planet earth I'd rather be than where I'm at right here. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Outside of a manual, when I was pastor, there's no other place I'd rather be than stay. Then I don't even have to be preaching, just sitting right there. And there's no other. Listen, we love you. We love the church. We love the singing. We, we, we love the preaching. We love, we love everything that goes on here. That's why we were up here so much. But when God said, step down, I said, okay, God, to what? Just step down, join First Baptist, and wait orders. 
Lord, I've got a large family. I've got a lot of bills every month that's going to come due whether I'm pastor or not. What am I going to do? God said, trust me. When I was here at the end of June and preached, y'all remember that message on faith out of Exodus? God gave that message to me right in the middle of this storm. I was living what I was preaching to you. Because God said, let go of the church, let go of your ministry, come up to, to Michigan. And it was like the, I gave it to the Lord and I didn't like what it was turning into. I'd always told God, I'll do whatever you say do. And that, that rod had turned into a serpent. My family and I, we were shut down just like y'all for online services only. And I was not going to announce to the church that it was time to leave online. And I wanted to make sure. So my wife and I and our kids decided to take a couple months and pray together, fast together. And we had issues we needed to work in our family and had issues we needed to deal with. And other things that just multiplied the pressure and the problems and, and the trouble in our life. And I'm just saying, when you come to Job, uh, that's where Job is at. And I understand where he's at. And maybe you've never been there. And if this is just a... Uh, maybe a preventative maintenance message and just tuck it away somewhere because I promise you somewhere down the road you're going to get to the place that you're going to wonder God I know I've got your word I know I've got the Holy Ghost I know I'm saved I know everything that's being preached is right I know I'm in a good church but God where are you in all this let me give you just a quick outline of the text, and then I just want to give you four four practical things the Lord dealt with my heart about in this. First of all, in verses 1 through 5, I want you to notice Job's complaint and everything that he's faced. Job says that he basically, his complaint is, Lord, I want to find you. He said, I want to find God. Look in verse number 3, all that I knew where I might find him. His complaint is, God, I'm looking for you and I just want answers and I just want you to explain to me what's going on and I just want to know why I had to lose all my children and why I had to lose all my servants and why I had to have all my property burn up. I've done right. I've lived for you. I've served you. I've given you everything I got. God, why are you? I just need you to show up in this, God. You ever been there? He said, I want to find him and I can't. His complaint is he wants to, he wants to lay out the facts for God. He says in verses one through five, he said in verse four, I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. He says, I know God's a just God and he's a fair God. And if I could just tell God what's going on, if I could just know he's hearing my arguments, my case, he'd rule on my behalf. But he said, I can't even feel like I've got an audience with him. His complaint is, I, I want to find God, but he can't. He wants to lay out the facts for God, but God's not near. He wants to figure out God. Verse 5, I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. He says, I want to figure you out, God. And can I just tell you, there's no figuring God out. Before we jump on Job, do we not get in storms and dark places in our life and do exactly what he does? Lord, I just need to find you and I'm not finding you. I need to lay out the facts for you, God. I, I need to figure out what's going on. That's his complaint. In verses 6 and 7, notice his confidence. In verse 6, Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. Despite his complaint, despite his frustration with God's silence, Job is certain of one thing. If he could just get an audience in God's presence, God would give him a fair hearing. God would deliver him. God would give him the strength that he needed. He just said, God, if I could hear from you, what do you mean, preacher, when you can't find God? I mean, you read your Bible and it's black letters on white pages. I mean, you go to church and you take notes and, and you hear the preaching and you know what's being said is right, but it's doing nothing on the inside. You go to God in prayer. And it's like an echo. You 
You look at your situation and, and you know you're doing right. You know you're trying to live right. God, why are you allowing this to occur in my life? And there's no answer. Job had many legitimate grievances about his present situation and questions about why he was suffering. And ultimately, though he knew that God was just and righteous, if he could just meet and hear from God, he knew everything would be okay. His confidence. But I want you to notice, thirdly, his confusion. In verses 8 and 9, he said, I go forward, but he's not there. Backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. He looked backward, forward, left, right. That, that, that left there is, or sorry, backward is, is looking west and forward would have been looking east and, and north would have been looking left and south would have been looking right. And in spite of looking every direction, Job says, I cannot find God he saw his works on the left the north I, I believe personally he's probably talking about those northern lights that could have been seen over there especially in the northern hemisphere the antithesis is God's working Job says, God, I see you in the stars. I see you with the moon shining. I see you with the northern lights. I see what you're doing for others, but I'm not seeing how you're working in my life. He said, I look to the north. He said, I look to the right hand. And that refers to the unexplored south, the it was regarded as uninhabitable because of its heat. In other words, Job is saying, he's somewhere I can't get to. Through March, April, May, June, July, I preached that Tuesday night here in June and the Lord had already told me a week or so, if I, I'm not exactly right on exact days, a week, week and a half before that, that the Sunday when I got back from here, I was to tell my church I was stepping down and at that time I had no house and we frantically looked the week that we were up here and was finding absolutely nothing and that's another story in itself and again, I was saying, okay God, you're saying do this but nothing's working out, nothing's coming available, nothing is showing itself up and God, why is this so hard? We're in your will and we're trying to do your will and, and we've stepped out by faith and we've said we'll do it and and listen I've got to tell a church of people that this is going to uh, unexpected this is going to be unexpected and everything's going good there's no fight there's no situation and I got to tell them I'm stepping down God this doesn't seem fair now, for the last year or so, I've been working with Brother David Wood and his soul winning ministries. And I'd gone to New Zealand with him last year and, and then done some soul winning training and some other things. And, and Brother Wood had been asking me multiple times from then to the beginning of this year, Brother Brian, would you come on board and help us? And after New Zealand, he said, would you be director of, of Australia and New Zealand and handle soul winning conferences over there and help me over there? And I said, sure, I'd love to. Uh, anything to get people to Christ, I'd love to be a part of that. And, and, and my church was gracious enough and missions was good enough that it wasn't a problem to buy the plane tickets and go over there and do, do those things. And I said, I'll be more than glad to help you. And he said, I want you to take a director role. And I said, that's fine. And, and, and then he called me in uh, late, late that year and he said, Brother Brian, I believe it may be God's will. I'm seven, he is 78 at the time. I'll be 79 and he is 79 now. And he said, maybe it's God's will for you to completely take over the ministry. If anything happens to me, I don't plan on stopping or slowing down, but I'm getting up in years and I understand I need to have a plan and, and your heart for soul winning and what God's let you do he said maybe you ought to take it and I said as long as I can pastor I have no problem helping you brother David I said, I've got a pastor's heart and I don't plan on leaving the church. And as long as you understand that I'm, I'm not making any promises, I, I'll, I'll do whatever I can. He said, that's fine. And, and, and then he said, but this is such a big ministry that I don't know how it would work. I said, well, I'm telling you right now, I'm willing to work with you as long as I pastor. He said, no problem. We did a soul winning conference at our church in January. And after that was over that night again, he I said, can you and I talk privately? I said, sure. We went to McDonald's, sat down, and he grabbed a cup of coffee. I got a cup of coffee, and, and we sat down, and he said, Brother Brian, I believe it's God's will for you to take over this ministry. 
I said, I appreciate that, Brother Wood, but can I take it over eventually and still stay pastor? He said, I think eventually you'd probably have to step down, but I think we're several years out. He said, I just want you to, to submit to, to saying you, you'll work with me and come alongside and not just be an assistant, but be my equal and work with me in the ministry. And I'm going to present you as, 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 as co-equal and with the idea that if anything happens to me, if I died tomorrow, you would step right into this role and take it over. And I, I said, well, brother, I want to pray about that. That's a big step. But as long as I can pastor and do what I'm supposed to do, I love what you're doing. I'm for what you're doing. Who's not? Who? Ought, everyone ought to be for soul winning. That's no problem. I'm working with him now. I don't know. Uh, in his mind, it's a done deal. When the Lord said I was to leave, I, I had a preached in a camp meeting earlier this week, and the pastor said, "Just tell people what you are and what you do." And I got up and borrowing a famous phrase from my good friend, Brother Willette, they I said, "I'm Brother Brian Treadway. I really don't know that I'm a missionary 100 percent. I don't think I'm an evangelist. I was a pastor, and I guess I'm just an unemployed preacher." Describes me pretty good right now. I am working with Brother David Wood in that soul winning ministry, but I told God just recently, Lord, if that's your will for me to do that from now on, you're going to have to remove this burning desire to pastor because it's strong. I'm not asking for sympathy. I'm just telling you that when God said leave, it was the hardest decision we ever made had nothing to do with you and I, you know I've had a few people brother Treadway are you okay I'm fine other than it's just it's hurt telling my mom and dad that I moved them there and telling them that we had to leave them when their health is really not good right now was tough to tell a church that loved you that thought you'd be there another 20 plus years that you're stepping down. Now, God did answer a prayer. And my last Sunday, we voted in a man that I recommended. And, and, and uh, by private ballot on a Sunday morning, 100%, they voted him in. And he's doing a good job. Been there a month, and he's a great man. And he doctrinally and soul winning and separation, he's right where I was. The only difference is he's way more laid back than I am. My staff is probably enjoying that a whole lot. I was 100 miles an hour all day, every day, morning to night, and he's, oh, y'all come in when you want. Now, he'll, he's never had a staff. He'll figure out real quick they'll take advantage of that, and he'll change that. I have no doubt. But he's very late, but a great man. But having to, to, to prep a church to take the man, and I, I, I know I'm preaching to Brother Willette, and he's done this, and, and this is old hat for him, but for me, I, didn't ha I don't have the popularity he has. I don't have the, the people skills he has. I don't have the contacts he has. And I'm not the preacher he is. And I said, Lord, we're going to starve to death. And in all this, I kept saying, God, where are you at? Church, to hurt you seems not that we don't appreciate you or this church or what's going on. And there ain't a man I'd rather have my family under than Pastor J.D. He's not just my friend. I respect him as a preacher. He has fed us since we've been here. But it's been different. When I'm the only pastor my kids have had, and I'm basically the only pastor my wife's had. We got married. She turned 18 May 21st. We got married June the 3rd. And I've pretty much been the preacher in her life all these years. I've not done a great job of that. But I'm, I'm, I'm all she's had, and I'm all my kids have had. And it's been a huge transition. We're used to the South. Come on now. <laughs> Culture is different. I mean, y'all are nice and, you know, very reserved and, you know, and even if someone's floundering, oh, you're doing a good job in the South, we just say, you better straighten it up or we're going to kick you in the hind end. I mean, there's just a difference. It's just, just different. And visiting, it was great, but now we're here. And everyone said, wait till winter. Thanks for the encouragement. Can I tell you, we had big snows in Abingdon. We're familiar with snow. We're familiar with ice. No one can drive on ice. Ice is ice. I grew up in Oklahoma. We didn't have snow. We had ice storms and had ice that thick. I understand ice. And, and y'all get more snow through the winter, but we would get a foot and a half at a time sometimes in the mountains. 
wasn't normal or regular, but a big snow for us, we, we'd get 15 inches to two feet in, in a day. Mm. Had to push all that out. So we're, we're a little familiar. And, but I told and I've been dreading it. And the devil's been fighting me and her on this winter business. And it's just like a week or a week and a half ago, the Lord just said, hey, quit where you're, you're used to, you're used to below zero temperature. Maybe not for two months in a row, but you're used to below zero temperature and you're used to snow and, and quit worrying about it. And then a light bulb clicked and he said, I'm one of the reasons I hated it is I was the pastor. I had to make sure the parking lot got plowed. And where are you going to put a foot and a half? of snow uh, when you got limited space and we would have mountains of snow places and, and it would take hours to get it done and I had to call men and make sure things got shoveled and, and just start, we lived on a hill and our church was on a hill and that drive was slick and literally it would be a 15 hour to 20 hour job from start to finish to get everything cleared out and ready for church and then as a pastor if you can't have service on a Sunday morning uh, you're, you're sweating the offering and you're sweating how are we going to make it when you go from week to week and it hit me the other day I don't have to fool with any of that anymore. <laughs> I got a little sidewalk and a little driveway, and if it don't get plowed, it don't matter. I said, let it snow. Bring it on. I don't have the pressure no more on me about the snow. Unless it hinders me from getting a meeting and feeding my family, then I will be under pressure. My point is, I'm just saying tonight, there's going to be times in your life, and I'm just sharing kind of where we've been and where we're at, and just using it in the message. Job looked at his life, and I'm telling you, I, though I knew this was what God said, God said, leave. God said, trust me. And then he got quiet. I'd read chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. I've preached all my life. Read till you get something. I wasn't getting nothing no matter how much I read. 15 chapters, 20 chapters, 30 chapters, 40 chapters, a book, two books. I'd pray, spend hours. God, where are you at? Maybe you've never been there, and I pray you never get there. I really do. But I know that as a child of God, that God's going to put all of us in these kind of situations. So what do you do? When you can't find God. Here's Job's conclusion in verse number 10. He knoweth the way that but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Four practical things Job says right there that helped me. First of all, here was Job's conclusion. In spite of my his confusion, his his complaint. Job says, first of all, I can't see God and find God, but he sees me, and he knows who I am. He knows the way that I take. You know what Job was saying? I could give you many verses, Psalm 1, 6, the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directed his step. Proverbs 3, there is a, the trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not in thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Psalm 139, Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting, mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compasseth my path, my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways Psalm 37 23 the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way I'm saying tonight God said to me and he said Job understood I may not be able to find God I may not know what's going on but Job said it really don't matter what's important is God knows where I'm at and he knows who I am and he's gonna provide and take care of me and I say tonight, maybe you can't find God, but I got good news for you. He ain't got no problem finding you. He knows where you're at. He knows the path you're on. Preacher, but I've slipped and messed up. It don't matter. He still knows where you're at. And he knows where you are. And he knows who you are. He's not forsook you. Job said, I can't see God. And I can't find, but he knows me. And he knows who I am. Secondly, Job in verse 10 says, when he hath tried me. In other words, Job is saying, here's what I've come to in spite of what I'm facing. God has a purpose in my life, and it's not punishment. 
I can't tell you how many times the devil has beat me down week after week, month after month, even when I sat here for several weeks. You're being punished. That's why you're not a pastor no more. You wasn't a good pastor. You didn't love your people enough. You didn't pray enough. You didn't do enough. You didn't love your family enough. That's why you had to step down. That's why you're struggling. That's why you're in the mess you're in. You're being punished. I'd say something to my wife and thank God for a good wife. And she'd say, Brian, that's stupid. You were a great pastor. Probably too good at times. I'd say something to pastor. I'd say, Brother J.D., I failed as a pastor. He'd say, oh, stop it. Such loving and kindness in him. He said, that's stupid and you know it, Treadway. I say, don't feel that way. Oh, stop it. You know better. Thank God for friends. Sometimes we get in these dark times and we feel as if, God, what have I done wrong? And the answer is, you've probably done nothing wrong. Now, we ought to examine ourselves and make sure. But can I tell you, Job said, when he hath tried me, what had Job done wrong? What brought this on? Job was a righteous and upright man when he had tried me. Job saying, he's got a purpose. I just don't know what it is. Thirdly, Job said in verse number 10, I shall come forth as gold. In other words, what he's saying is God's going to bring something good and better out of it even than where I was. That's a hard statement to swallow. Because sometimes you'll get in the deepest, darkest valley of your life and everything's crashing and you think, how in the world can something good and better come out of this? This is awful. This is horrible. This is not right. God, how can something? Can I just tell you, I don't have all the answers to that. But what I know is God has promised that he never tries us that we don't come out better. I don't know what God's got. I've laid in bed many a time. I've gone to my prayer to altar many a time and said, God, how could it be better than what I had at Emmanuel? How could it be any greater than what you were doing? How could I be any happier than what I was there? And, and I don't know the answer to that, but I'm saying Job gives us some hope and he says no matter how dark it may seem and whether you find God or not, understand God is going to bring something better and greater out of it. And then lastly... He said, when I come forth, I shall come forth as gold. In other words, and this is the greatest thing that God helped me with. Here's what Job's saying. In spite of all that I'm facing, all that I've been through, God still values me. I'm gold. You understand what he's saying? He sat in the ashes. He felt like nothing. He felt like everything had been stripped. But he says, when I come out of this, I'm coming out as gold. In other words, he realized he still mattered to God and he was still worth something. You know what the devil will do in your trial and trouble? He'll tell you God doesn't love you. God doesn't care. God's put you on a shelf. God's done with you. God's not going to use you. You're finished. You're washed up. You're done. I'm telling you that's a lie of the devil. That's a lie of the flesh. And we all buy into it. And I understand that. But I'm saying Job grabbed a hold of the fact that God valued him for who he was and what he was. Only precious metals are put through the fire. Spurgeon said, and I quote, It looks very hard to believe that a child of God should be tried by the loss of his father's presence and yet should come forth uninjured by the trial. Yet, Spurgeon said, no gold is ever injured in the fire. Stoke the furnace as hot as you want. Let the blast of the fire be as strong as you will. Thrust the piece of gold into the very center of the flame. Pile on more fuel. Let another blast torment the coals till they become the most vehement heat that they've ever had. Yet the gold is losing nothing. And it may even be gaining, Spurgeon said. 
In other words, what he is saying is when God allows these times in our life, all the gold loses is not any value in itself. All the gold loses when it's put through the fire is what's not supposed to be on it or in it to begin with. And when it comes out of the fire, it's worth more and valued more and better than it was before it went in. And may I say, child of God, God lets us go through these times because he knows that listen and we may think we're going to cave and fall and not make it and crash but I'm here to tell you gold's never put in the fire to suffer loss and it loses nothing other than what's not supposed to be there to begin with can I say whenever you come out of this and I've told my family about a week and a half ago maybe two weeks ago my birthday the Sunday the 16th that night or that week, sometime right around there, it's just like a light bulb went off, Brother Willette, and I've been preaching for many years, and I know I should have got this a lot earlier, but it's just like God said, hey, dummy, change your mindset. Quit looking at what you've lost and quit looking at what you gave up and quit looking at the pain and quit looking at the suffering. And yes, it's all there. And yes, I know you're going to hurt, but you ain't doing yourself no good. And Brian, you can't even see me because of the pain and the suffering. And I've been here all along. I've guided every step. I've led you every step of the way. Look at where you're at. Look at what you got. Change your mindset. And then Brother Burden, who's a close friend, I love Brother Adrian. I say close, a good, that's not a fair statement, a good friend. I don't have a lot of close friends, but he's a good friend. Brother Adrian come in here Tuesday and just put that, God had already dealt with me. Brother Dalton was gracious and had me teach Sunday school last Sunday. And if no one else in the class needed it, me and my wife needed it, is this like God confirmed what he'd been dealing with me with that weekend? Hey, get over yourself and quit looking at you and get your eyes back on God and get, and then Brother Burden come in here, crazy thing. And, 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 and listen, I helped get him in here and told Brother J.D. he's a great guy. And then he gets up here and preaches to me the audacity. <laughs> and Tuesday night, God said, Hey, what kind of church member you been? I said, man, I've been, I was a good pastor. Lord, I did this. He said, no, 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 no. You ain't a pastor no more. You're a member of First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. I said, yeah, God, I've just been here a few weeks. I said, have you looked around and seen if maybe someone else is hurting? Have you looked around to see maybe what you could do to help someone else? I said, well, God, I, I've been needing me help. He said, exactly you. Again, the light bulb went off and God said, quit it. I want to say tonight, church, maybe you don't need this, but I'm afraid the majority of the reason we stay in the storm and we don't get help is because we don't allow our mindset to be what it needs to be. It got dark, more dark than I'll tell you. Dark for me, dark for my wife, dark for our children. But I want to say tonight on God's word, he's good. And I don't know what all he's doing, and I don't know what all he's got planned. I know we're working with Brother David Wood. I know that we're going to need support. And for me to call preachers and ask for help and support goes against everything in me because I like giving. I don't like receiving. But I got mouths to feed and bills to pay, and God said, okay, then, you know, you'll sit there till you starve, I reckon. But here's what I know. I know that when we get in these times that we can't find God. Job said, he knows where you're at. You're still valuable. You're still worth something. You still matter. And he's still got a purpose. We're thrilled to be here. And I don't believe God put us in this church just to say it. I want to be used. I may not be a pastor, but God's given us many years of service, and I want to do whatever I can to help this church grow. I want to find out exactly what God wants us to do. We're, that, like I said, working with Brother Wood. Right now we're working on a project with India, and I'm excited about that. I'm not going to take the time. I went, went to my time anyway, but I'm just saying tonight, we need your prayers. But when God gave me the message, he helped me and said, look, I ain't forgot about you. Do you feel like God's forgot about you tonight? Let's bow our heads, close our eyes.
If the Lord spoke to your heart, why don't you just mind the Lord but while instruments are coming, pastor's coming? You may not, we shouldn't need prompting. If God's dealt with you, if he could use my honesty and hopefully my, my I'm just telling you, I've never been in the position I've been in the last few months. But I'll also tell you, I've never seen the grace and the power of God like I've seen the last few months. And as hard as it's been and as hurtful as it's been and as heavy as it's been, I've watched God do many, many things just to show us it's going to be okay. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, folks are coming. What a song. Sister Jill's playing. Again, church, you've been so kind to us. Thank you. If I tried to call names, we're still trying to learn all the names, but many of you at just the right moment have slipped a gift card in our hand or dropped something off at the house. We're more than appreciative. We don't deserve it. And thank you for your kindness towards us. But I want to affirm to this church that God's got a plan for everyone in here, including the Treadway family, and he's got a plan for you tonight no matter what you're facing. I hope this maybe explains where we're at, what's going on. If you've seen hurt, if you've seen tears, it's not because of you and it's not because of God. It's just been an adjustment. But to our shame, we should have handled it a lot better. And I'm thankful I serve a God that will mercifully and gently just get us to where we need to be. If you can't find him, why don't you get an altar and say, God, help me tonight. Father, thank you for your help. Thank you for your presence. I've sensed you. I pray I've not said anything that would grieve you or the pastor of this church, but help somebody. Use the message. Guide and direct us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.